Hey, this is Dr. Corey Glenn, and I thought I'd make a quick video going over how to evaluate for an anterior loop. Uh, this is something that comes up quite often in the courses I give on guided surgery. As we're going through cone beams, people will see uh, little branches coming off the um, mandibular canal. They get confused. Is that an anterior loop? Is it the incisive canal? And so this is one of the cases we do in that course, and it really demonstrates this very well. And so I'm in blue sky plan right now. As you can see, this is an edentulous patient, fairly resorbed. And in this panoramic window, one of the things you can do is change from this composite view, which is basically stacking all the slices between these two yellow uh, lines, and you can change to a slice view. Now the slice view is only going to reflect the single slice as indicated by this yellow line. And the reason that's kind of cool is because I can take this line and you see how it's manipulating it down in the pan. We can actually align all these nodes until you can see the entire canal throughout its entire length. Okay, so I've already done this for the purpose of this video on both sides. And if you look here, you might be tempted, and most people do in the courses, uh, tend to think that the canal starts back here and it's coming down, as you can see right here. And then this is actually where the foramen is. If I was to click right here, you see over here in the cross-sectional view, that's your mental foramen very clearly. But the confusion comes because they'll see this continuing on past that. And so the thought is, is that a really large anterior loop? What, what is that thing? Am I gonna uh, you know, get sued if I violate that? What's the problem here? And so what I wanted to make clear is that that is actually the incisive canal. Um, when your mandibular canal comes down and then it exits out through the mental foramen, not all of it exits. There's actually still a bundle that continues on down towards the, the middle of the mandible, and that is the incisive canal. It's just the continuation of the mandibular canal beyond the uh, mental foramen. Now, what's unique about this is all it does is provide the blood supply and the innervation to the anterior teeth. So in the case where a patient is missing those teeth, there's really not much consequence to violating that. Um, it generally, it will bleed a little excessive, but because it's completely contained, you can put your implant in and that will contain it. Um, so let's go through how do you evaluate if uh, that's a, an anterior loop or if it's the incisive canal. A couple things to point out, your incisive canal is going to take a different route in most people. And so what will happen is you're going to have this, uh, this canal swooping down. It's going to come to the mental foramen right here. And in most people, it's going to exit out of there. You'll occasionally see a small loop, but I really don't see them that often. But again, in some people, you'll see a, a fairly pronounced canal continuing. Now, how do we know that that's not an anterior loop? By a couple of ways. One, it's not ever going to come back. If you were to just keep following this thing, it's not ever going to come back to the mental foramen. Um, also, most of the studies show that it would be incredibly rare to see one that goes beyond five millimeters past the mental, mental foramen. And clearly here, we're, we're a good eight, 10 millimeters past. Same thing on this side. If you look in the pan, uh, you're coming down here, mental foramen, that's where it exits, but then you have this coming down. So the other attribute you'll notice is that when you're, uh, when it's a incisive canal, you're gonna see it again, come down, exit at mental foramen, and then the incisive canal always dives down superiorly. It goes downward towards the feet in this little slope like you're seeing. And it's actually going to come up here to the middle of the mandible and it's going to anastomose with the uh, incisive canal from the patient's opposite side. There's a lot of cross innervation there uh, and blood supply. And then finally, that's going to merge at the midpoint where it will anastomose um, right beside the uh, genial tubercles. So if you see right here, this big vessel coming in right by the genial tubercles, well, this is all going to kind of come together in that area. So I don't generally worry too much about hitting the incisive canal because it's a little consequence, we'll have a little extra bleeding, but it'll be easily controlled and it'll, it'll stop when you plug it with an implant. What does worry me is midline implants. Oftentimes, if you're placing a midline implant, and particularly if you're doing it um, in a freehand approach where you don't necessarily know where your drill is going, the danger that you run into is that if you're penetrating down, and I'm going to put in an implant here just to help you visualize this. Let's say that you're going to be positioning an implant, and you know you freehand the case, and you know you 
appear to be fully within bone with your entire implant. But the danger is that if you sever this blood vessel, you know, arteries are muscle. And so what does muscle do when it's severed? It's going to contract. So the risky thing about placing midline implants is that if this arterial retracts back into the floor of the mouth, that thing is a, a pretty hard pumper. There's a lot of blood flow to that area. It's highly vascularized in the tongue and the floor of the mouth. And if that vessel retracts back into the floor of the mouth, well, now it's unrestrained. It's not pumping into a mandible anymore. It's just a loose vessel pumping blood into this space. And that can turn into a serious medical emergency. Um, I don't think there's hardly been many cases where people have died in implant surgery, but of the few that I'm aware of, some of them related to this. Patients uh, end up with bleeding in the floor of the mouth that is not caught. And then it ends up swelling the floor of their mouth so much that it occludes the airway. And at that point, that's a true medical emergency. Um, so the easy way to avoid this is just don't place midline implants. If you are going to place a midline implant, make sure you're very experienced with dealing with this stuff. And I would try to get it as far away from that vessel as you can up here in the anterior mandible. But I really find it infrequent that I just have to have uh, an implant right there in the middle of the mandible. So back to the original thing that we were talking about, how do we know if this is the mandibular canal and if it ends right here, or if this continues on, if that's a anterior loop or the incisive canal? Again, one is the, the path it's going to take. It's going to go downward from the mental foramen and continue towards the midline. Second, it won't ever come back. And the easiest way to evaluate that is to look in a uh, axial slice. So I'm gonna turn off this preview here. And let's take this slider and go right to the level of the mental foramen. So we're going, we're starting up the crest of the ridge. Now we're coming down. Great picture of this vessel coming in right here. Again, the, the one that you got to be a little bit worried about. If you nip that too close to the lingual border, that's a problem. Um, but here you see that the nerve canal is coming down. And you do see there's a slight anterior loop. You know, it doesn't just come right here and go straight out. There's maybe a millimeter, maximum two millimeter anterior loop, and then it tracks back and exits out. OK, that's a true anterior loop. However, look at this as so again, we started up here at the ridge. We're coming down. There's the mental foramen. And now we're going deeper. And remember what we're looking for, if it's actually the incisive canal, is that it's going to be down deeper than the, the foramen. And so when I get down here, I'm seeing this big canal space. That is that downward and medial dive that I was talking about that the incisive canal will take. And if I was to keep on tracking this, notice that it, it never comes back. There's not anything that's uh, coming back towards the mental foramen to exit out. The only loop that we have is this tiny amount right here. We look at the other side. It's a similar story. You've got your canal coming down. You've perhaps got a loop of one or two millimeters right here, as you can see. But then if we continue on downward, notice now this canal coming off. And it's going to continue as we get deeper, traveling anteriorly. It's a little bit more difficult to make that one uh, uh, visible. But certainly on this other side, you can definitely see this large canal that is continuing down into the middle of the mandible. So whenever you're evaluating for this, make sure that you, you map your nerve properly, but always go back and check. And the, the place you wanna check is in this axial slice. Scroll down to the mental foramen, evaluate at the level of the mental foramen if it's curving anteriorly and then coming back. And if you continue to go down deeper in that axial slice, and you see a canal going forward that does not return, that is a, a incisive canal. And again, that's not of a huge consequence if we violate that, um, but we definitely do want to avoid violating an anterior loop because that's obviously going to have a sensation to buccal mucosa, to the, the lip, and some of those areas. So that will um, you know, harm the patient if they have that violated. So you definitely want to maintain a close enough or a uh, long enough distance away from an anterior loop so that you know you're not going to violate that. Again, one of my reasons I love guided surgery is I can, first of all, map all this out on the CT, know exactly where it is, and then plan my implants to avoid that. Um, you know, in the old freehand days, it was always recommended for full arch cases that you reflect fully 
down to the mental foramen and then actually take a probe and stick in there and see if it's continuing uh, mesially. And the general rule was stay five millimeters anterior to that. Well, a lot of the cases now that are being done with all on four and things like that with disto angulated implants, if you're five millimeters anterior of that uh, mental foramen, you're probably going to be too far forward and you're going to be emerging even with a tilted implant in like first premolar, sometimes even canine I've seen. And so that's something you want to avoid. So hopefully this video will help you make sense of where that mental foramen is, where the mandibular canal is, and where the incisive canal is, and allow you to be able to better plan your implants without worrying about are you going to hit something that could you know, cause loss of sensation to the patient.